Grace and peace to you in the name of the human one, Jesus Christ. Good morning. Welcome to worship at Fairmount Presbyterian Church. Whether you're worshiping with us here in the sanctuary uh, or online, we are so glad uh, that you are here with us on this Sunday. Um, we invite you to grab those pew pads that are uh, on the ends of your pews and sign in and pass them down. Uh, greet one another by name if you can uh, as we pass the peace later in the service. Um, if you've got kids here this morning, our wiggle room is in the back corner. Kids are always welcome in the sanctuary, but if they need to move around a little bit more, uh, Anna and Atia are back in the wiggle room to hang out with uh, our kids. Um, and this year, our spiritual theme at Fairmount is, I, I tried this in the 830 service and people are still learning it, so I'm going to tell you, but you need to memorize this, okay? The time is now, our urgent need for Sabbath. We live in a fast-paced world that seems to be getting faster all the time, a world that is constantly telling us to do more, to be more efficient, to have more, to be more productive, to be more everything, and we believe this has led to a cultural disease that we call psychronkite, which means time sickness. But this isn't what God intends for us. God invites us to rest, into Sabbath. And so last Sunday, we started a new chapter in our year-long focus that we're calling Sabbath is for Renewing Relationships. So from now until Advent, we will be focusing on how we can renew our relationships with God and with one another. A few announcements to highlight this morning in your bulletins. Uh, it's the last call for our Sabbath small groups, which will be launching in November. We have at least four groups that are forming. Uh, they'll meet once a month at different times and locations. Um, there's a few spots left in these groups, so if you want to sign up, you can do that online or in Anderson Hall. Um, if you're interested in learning more about what it means to be a member of Fairmount Presbyterian Church, uh, Pastor Lindsay and I will be uh, hosting two Explore Fairmount gatherings on Sunday, November 5th after worship, and then again on Wednesday, November 8th at 6 o'clock. Um, you can talk to one of us if you're interested in learning more and sign up for that online as well. Lastly, we need uh, at least a dozen more Fairmounters to support our partnership with North Presbyterian Church in Cleveland. Uh, each Sunday in November, as a celebration of our partnership together, a small group of Fairmounters will be going to North Presbyterian uh, to worship with them and to share lunch after with them. So we need volunteers both to help prepare food and to take it over and serve and to eat with them. Uh, Pastor Carmen is helping coordinate that, and uh, if you're interested in signing up, um, you can see her in Anderson Hall right after worship today. Uh, looking ahead to next Sunday, we're going to welcome Maria Fosha, who is president and CEO of Lutheran Metropolitan Ministry. Um, she'll be in worship with us at 11 o'clock to share a brief word uh, about um, uh, what LMM is up to, including uh, premiering a video uh, about the house that Fairmount has helped sponsor in Norwood. Um, and then after worship, um, she and I will lead a presentation and a discussion together about uh, the future of affordable housing in Cleveland. Um, after worship next Sunday, SOS will also be gathering for their October luncheon uh, downstairs, uh, and Dr. Sharon Milligan will be uh, speaking. Um, be sure to read all of the other announcements, not right now, but later, that are in your bulletin. Uh, our midweek sabbatical uh, service returns this Wednesday. We continue a Zoom series on queer Christian theology on Thursday. We have court watching training on Tuesday and Wednesday. And Ginger Van Wagenen uh, will be in Anderson Hall if you're interested in learning uh, more to help with court watching. And then our interfaith book study kicks off with uh, Anche Hesed Fairmount Temple uh, in about a week. Um, the flowers behind me, uh, these beautiful flowers, um, are from the memorial of Fred Brew that happened here in the sanctuary uh, on Friday, uh, and we uh, pray for his uh, family, his uh, wife Karen, and all of his children as, as they grieve and celebrate his life, and also celebrate uh, today the, the wedding of Sarah LaCroix, Kevin and Catherine LaCroix's daughter that I was uh, honored to officiate yesterday uh, afternoon. Beloved, the time is now for worship. But before our call to worship, we observe a moment of statio. Statio is a holy pause. 
It's one of those Sabbath moments, a moment to pause between activities. And so as we gather as one body for worship, we observe this holy pause to prepare our bodies, our minds, and our souls for worship. Now please rise in body or in spirit for our call to worship. In God alone, my soul can find rest and peace. In God alone, my peace and joy. Only in God, my soul can find its rest. Find its rest and peace. God is not far from us. When trouble is near, God is our help and refuge, a very present help in trouble. 
let us confess our sins to God that we might receive mercy. Let us pray. We know the commandments and we are sure we follow them, but instead we cannot let go of the things we think we need or what we think is important. We do not follow you or love you, O oh God, with all our hearts, our minds, our strength. Forgive us for our focus. Take a moment now in silence to confess your personal sin before God. Hear this good news. Like us, Jesus was tempted in the wilderness and so is able to sympathize with us in our weaknesses. Therefore, we can be bold to approach God in humility and receive mercy, finding grace just when we need it. For in Jesus, we find the forgiveness we seek. May the peace of Christ be with you. Now share that peace of Christ with your neighbor. <laughs> All right, kids, come on up. Make, your, make, make way for the kids to come on up for time for young disciples. Good morning, good morning. Come on up, Millie and Margo. Okay, does anybody remember how we started worship just a few minutes ago? After I read the announcements, what did we do? Oh, come on. <laughs> After we read the announcements, we did nothing, right? 
We sat quietly. We call it statio. But if that's just a fancy word for sitting quietly. You don't like it? Well, we're going to talk about it. I know you don't, my, my daughter. Um, statio, that means pause. It's a moment to pause, to be quiet and still. And you said that because can, is it sometimes a little bit hard to be quiet and still? So hard. So hard. It's hard for grown-ups, too. Um, we all know it can be hard. So what we're going to do this morning is read this book that tells us a little bit about how to be quiet and still. And it's called Quiet by Tommy DePaolo. My, oh my, the grandfather said, everything is in such a hurry. The birds are all flying so fast. And our dog is rushing after the ball, said the girl. I see a frog jumping high into the pond, said the boy. And a dragonfly zooming over the water. Even the trees are waving their leaves. Busy as busy can be. Let's not be so busy. Why don't we sit here, you next to me? The birds are just like us, taking a rest, singing their song. Our dog is tired. I think he's dreaming. The frog is sitting and blinking. The dragonfly has stopped beating its wings. Let us be quiet, like all our friends, quiet and still. I can think when I'm quiet. I can see when I'm still. To be quiet and still is a special thing. What do you think? Can you be quiet and still? <laughs> well, look, I'll tell you what. You don't have to be quiet and still all the time. There's plenty of times when it's good for us to be moving our bodies and talking and doing other things. But... There are also times for us to be quiet and still. And those, that pause we took at the beginning of worship, that statio pause, you can take that quiet pause any time. And when you do, when you stop moving your bodies, when you stop talking, sometimes when you even try to stop thinking, it's in those moments that we can find God the best sometimes. If you're going to we time today, you're going to be talking more about quiet and about finding ways to rest. And if you're staying here, I want you to listen for Pastor Lin in Pastor Lindsay's sermon for a few things. One, what gift did Pastor Lindsay get for her birthday this week? Number two, where does God live? And number three, in the language of the Potawatomi people, are rocks dead or alive? Let's pray. Will you pray with me? God of rest, help us to know what time it is. When it is time to move and when it is time to be still. When it's time to speak and when it's time to be quiet. And when we rest, help us find you, God. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.
The first reading of God's word comes to us from Exodus chapter 31, verse 12 through 17. Thus saith the Lord. The Lord said to Moses, tell the Israelites, be sure to keep my Sabbath. Because the Sabbath is a sign between me and you in every generation. So you will know that I am the Lord who makes you holy. Keep the Sabbath because it is holy for you. Everyone who violates the Sabbath will be put to death. Whoever does any work on the Sabbath, that person will be cut off from the people. Do your work for six days, but the seventh day is a Sabbath of complete rest that is holy to the Lord. Whoever does any work on the Sabbath day will be put to death. The Israelites should keep the Sabbath. They should observe the Sabbath in every generation as a covenant for all time. It is a sign forever between me and the Israelites that in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth and on the seventh day the Lord rested and was refreshed. Amen. Our second scripture lesson today comes from Hebrews in the fourth chapter. Let us continue to listen for God's word to us this day. Therefore, since the promise that we can enter into rest is still open, let's be careful so that none of you will appear to miss it. So you see that a Sabbath rest is left open for God's people. The one who entered God's rest also rested from his works, just as God rested from his own. For the word of God in scripture, for the word of God around us, for the word of God within us, thanks be to God. Well, two years ago, I began what has become a birthday tradition. I went to the Monterey Bay Aquarium by myself. It turns out that if you go to the Monterey Bay Aquarium on your birthday and you walk up to the information desk and you tell them it is your birthday, they will be excited for you. And then they will ask you how you spell your name. And they'll pull out a Sharpie and an oversized pin with an adorable otter on it. And they'll draw a little birthday hat on the otter and write your name on the pin. I have two of those pins. One is on the cork board in my home office slash sewing nook, and the other lives on my backpack, helping me be ready for any adventure that might present itself. Well, this year, I wasn't able to make my way to California for my birthday, but I did the second best thing. Don't tell my children, but on Friday, I headed to the Cleveland Aquarium by myself. It turns out that if you tell them nicely that it's your birthday, they will also give you a pin. My new pin has a jellyfish on it, and it's been added to the collection. Well, as I was there Friday and lingering with the new octopus, feeding the stingrays, and sitting in front of the large shark tank, making a new Sabbath buddy with one of the black drum fish that's very large, it dawned on me. What if? Part of the reason, or even the reason, God rested on the seventh day of creation was that God wanted to take time to look at, to experience, and to live in the midst of the beauty of the world that God had created. The sun and the moon, the plants and the waters, the fish of the sea, and every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. After all, God had called it all good. Even humans. God created humankind in God's image and called them good. What if God just wanted to take a little time to experience all that goodness and that beauty, to rest in it? Well, we all know that things went a little downhill after the creation. And the Israelites, the descendants of these first humans, ended up being ruled over by a king who did not know their story and worried about them taking his power and his control. And so this king, in the first chapter of Exodus, 
sets taskmasters over them to oppress them with forced labor. And continuing through generations and a variety of rulers and pharaohs to overwork the people, making them labor without rest. The people cry out to God who hears them and raises up Moses, Moses who frees his people from oppression, leading them out into the wilderness. Now, as we've been talking about for the last few weeks, the Israelites aren't always so keen on living in the wilderness, but God continues to respond to meet the needs of God's people, sending them manna and water and even rules on how to live well together and in relationship with God. And then we get to this section of Exodus, and God decides, I'm going to build a home right in the middle of all of you. Now, to the modern reader, it might not sound all that impressive, but believe me when I say that this is notable. One scholar explains it this way. God leaves the mountain, the typical abode for gods in the ancient Near East, and comes to dwell among the people of God. God is not like the gods who remain often uncaring and oblivious to the troubles of the creatures. God leaves the mountain of remoteness and ineffable majesty and tabernacles lives right in the center of the human community. God decides to live in the midst of the very humans that God calls good, even though they have big time fallen short of who God has created them and called them to be. So then we get chapter upon chapter in which there are instructions for the building of this tabernacle, how it will be made, from what it will be made, how many cubits high and wide it shall be, and with what precious materials it will be created. Again, might not sound all that exciting to the modern reader, but it does give a visual for those of us who couldn't be there, a real concrete understanding that God wanted to be with the people. And it's a thing of beauty. And the vestments of the priests who preside over it, gorgeous. There are intricate textiles and carvings and numbers of pillars. This is not something that can be created by human hands in mere days, and so enters in our reading for this morning. Now, this reading that Carmen read is not super easy to listen to. You will die if you do not rest on the Sabbath. That's hard to hear. And it's quite different from the five chapters of the detailed building instructions that preceded it. But don't worry, here comes theologian Walter Brueggemann to the rescue, helping us understand the violation of the Sabbath is not as innocuous as it seems. This text evidences anxiety that any violation of Sabbath as obedient work stoppage means being seduced by the production values and rewards of Pharaoh, which will predictably end in slavery. Thus, profaning the Sabbath means jeopardizing all that is most precious and definitional about Israel's existence in the world and its loyalty to Yahweh. See, God decided from the get-go who God would be, how God would be, and it turns out that that is very different than the earthly kings and rulers who come to take charge and dominion over God's people. God is pointing out in this text that God is so very different than Pharaoh. Pharaoh has decided that the worth of these children of God depends on what they can do, what they can lift, what they can produce. It's as though God is saying, I'm not Pharaoh. I don't care about the number of bricks you make in a day. I have given you instructions on how to build my tabernacle, but a part of those instructions is resting every seventh day because I know we all need rest. I don't need you to prove that you can build the tabernacle faster if you didn't have breaks. That's not the point. This is a different kind of system we've got going on here. See, God lives here with us and does not believe that our worth has anything to do with our bank account or the kind of car we drive or the vacations we take or the neighborhoods we live in or the number of hours we work. God created us and called us good from the start. 
And God wants to spend time dwelling in this beautiful and beloved creation with us. With us. Sabbath, Brueggemann writes, is an urgent check on the ideology of productivity. If the goal of life is, as in the previous chapters of Exodus, the presence of God, then it is clear that a life committed to endless productivity is empty of the promise of God and cut off from the powers of holiness. Such a life violates the very fabric of creation. Can we just sit with that? <laughs> for a moment, a life committed to endless productivity violates the very fabric of creation. One of the things that I've been doing lately, which in some ways started out as a way to check off an item on a very long and nebulous to-do list of mine, is that I've been listening to the book Braiding Sweetgrass, Indigenous Wisdom, Scientific Knowledge, and the Teaching of Plants by Robin Wall Kimmerer. As her bio reads, Wall Kimmerer is a mother, scientist, decorated professor, and an enrolled member of the citizen Potawatomi Nation. I say this was a part of my to-do list because I've been wanting to read this book for quite some time. You see, my mother instilled in me from a young age a respect for indigenous people and stories, as well as a curiosity and a desire to learn more about the people, spirituality, and the lands upon which we now live. I've heard so many people rave about this book, and I knew I would love it, but life and a large pile of other books kept getting in the way. But then recently, it occurred to me, maybe there's an audio book of this one. And I thought, oh. I could listen to it while folding laundry and stitching a new quilt and going on those morning walks I've been avoiding. And so I started listening to the author read her own words, and it has become a Sabbath practice for me. Her words have slowed me down and invited me to rest in the beauty of the world, the profound holiness of the ordinary world we live in along with the divine. This book is a gathering of essays, one of which is about her struggling to learn the Potawatomi language. She writes of attending a class for which there was a great deal of excitement. For the first time, every single fluent speaker in our tribe would be there as teacher, she says. Nine. Nine fluent speakers in the whole world. She goes on to describe how hard it is for her to learn the language, not just the vocabulary, but the grammar. To whom does our language extend the grammar of animacy, she writes. Animacy referring to how sentient or alive something is. Naturally, plants and animals are animate, she continues, but as I learn, I am discovering that the Potawatomi understanding of what it means to be animate diverges from the list of attributes of a living being we all learned in Biology 101. In Potawatomi 101, rocks are animate, as are mountains, and water, and fire, and places. Beings that are imbued with spirit, our sacred medicine, our songs, drums, and even stories, are all animate. The list of the inanimate seems to be smaller, filled with objects that are made by people. Of an inanimate being, like a table, we say, what is it? And we answer, dope ye way, table it is. But of an apple, we must say, who is that being? And reply, mishmin Yahweh, apple is that being. Yahweh, Y-A-W-E, the animate to be. I am, you are, she, he is. To speak of those possessed with life and spirit, we must say Yahweh. By what linguistic confluence, she asked, do Yahweh of the Old Testament, Y-A-H-W-E-H, -E and Yahweh of the New World both fall from the mouths of the reverend? Isn't this just what it means to be? To have the breath of life within? To be the offspring of creation? 
when I listened to that section of the book, I was walking home from the grocery store with a shelf-stable tub of icing in my hand, which is like totally the opposite of everything she's talking about in this book. And I must have looked ridiculous because I came to a full stop with my mouth gaping open. <gasps> Isn't that just what it means to be? To have the breath of life within to be the offspring of creation? Isn't it amazing that when the Holy Spirit shows up, she can both take your breath away and breathe into you new life? A refreshment of life, of soul, of self. What it means to be, to have the breath of life within, to be the offspring of creation. Our Genesis story tells us that God breathed life into the first humans, these offspring of creation. And God, after finishing all the pieces of creation, rested and was refreshed. The author of Hebrews makes it clear in his sermon that the rest has been promised and is available still to us all. Initially, this rest was a place, a land of their own. And in this sermon, he, the, the Hebrews is, this understanding shifts to a concept beyond land, toward a condition in which we participate with God. As one commentator writes, rest now becomes a synonym for salvation, the presence of God now and in the future. In this rest, it's open to all of us, to you and to me. God invites us into this refreshment, into this time to rest in the beauty of creation and God's presence. Now, for ages and ages, God has been trying to tell us, to convince us, that this idol of productivity is killing us. It is killing us. We may live longer than any generation before us, but this idol is not what gives us life. It's God. God who breathes into us this life and through rest refreshes us. Your worth God says, does not lie in your ability to produce minute after minute, hour after hour, day after day. But don't get me wrong, your work, whatever it may be, is important. The work we do within our own person and interpersonally and community, it matters and it makes a difference. But that is not the sum total of our work. And honestly, we couldn't get to that work or at least be very effective in it without relationships, without creating, building, maintaining, and renewing our relationships with God and with our neighbor. Rest, Brueggemann says, is not just recuperation for the next day's work, but it is the goal and the climactic event of all creation, the point of it all. Friends, it's the rhythm that God knew was necessary for both God and for us, a rhythm that includes taking time to believe that rest is important and to believe that God's love is freely given and that God makes a home here with us. So I want to leave you with a challenge today. I want you to seriously think about and maybe even make a plan or a place, or a time, or a way in which you are going to set aside time to rest in the beauty of God's creation and God's presence. Now, it will look different for each of us. <laughs> it might look like carving out a few hours to wander around the art museum, or maybe it looks like taking a walk in the woods. It might be savoring the words of your favorite poet, or painting a mountain landscape, or just really enjoying a quiet moment as you sip that first sip of coffee. And as you do it, whatever it is, remember that you don't need to prove anything to anybody to have God join you in that moment. So seriously, there are some cards in your bulletin this morning. There should be two of them. And if you don't have any, We'll find you a piece of paper. But the next moments of the service, I want you to really think about this question that's at the bottom of the sermon. How will you slow down and take time to renew your relationship to God? 
We hope that you will write it twice on your cards, one for you to keep and one for you to pass in in the offering basket or however you get it to us. We are going to take these ideas, these ways in which you are finding rest, and we're going to use them to transform these clocks. So as you think about this, remember, isn't this just what it means to be? To have the breath of life within? To be the offspring of creation? Alleluia and amen. of faith. In God alone, my soul can find rest and peace. In God alone, my peace and joy. Only in God, my soul can find its rest, find its rest and peace. Amen. Last Sunday, uh, Peggy Roberts, the chair of our stewardship committee, announced the launch of our 2024 stewardship campaign and asked you to consider making a pledge next year. And now it's my turn. Um, and you know, they say that the best salesperson is the one who really believes in what they're selling. And I've got to tell you, I really believe in what we're doing here at Fairmount. Um, if you are listening to some of the uh, things that we announced at the uh, uh, beginning of worship or read in your bulletin, um, I think uh, it's pretty amazing. Um, it's not just that we're offering a lot of programs, um, it's that the spiritual depth of what we're doing, both inside these walls and out in the community, uh, is pretty remarkable. Um, and I think there are three ingredients um, to, uh, uh, of what has made it happen. The first uh, and foremost is uh, the grace of God. Um, the second is our amazing, passionate, dedicated staff, um, not just the pastors and the music staff you see in worship, but all of the staff.
who do behind the scenes work here also. And the third, of course, is you. It's your generous gifts of time, talent, and treasure uh, that have made this possible. And we can't wait to see what God will do with us in this year ahead. Um, you should be receiving a letter in the mail from our stewardship committee along with the pledge card. You can send that back into the church. You can pledge online. You'll also find pledge cards uh, in the pew right in front of you that you can drop in the offering plate. Um, and on behalf of the entire Fairmount staff, uh, we are so grateful for each and every one of you. Uh, thank you for opening up uh, your hearts and sharing your gifts so that we can do the ministry that we feel called to do together. Um, let's bring our gifts to God.
us pray. God of wisdom, we present these gifts of our very selves and renew our commitment to follow you. Give us the courage to live into your rhythms of work and of rest, so that with everything we say and do and give, we become a living offering, one of your beloved. It is in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Uh, as we gather to pray, uh, we also recognize uh, that there are many who are online worshiping with us. Uh, folks uh, who uh, uh, let us know that they're with us this morning, Edna Trinad, Carl Hoffman, Christina White, John and Peg Zitzner, Willa Jordan, Peter and Brenda Horth, Elaine Price and Gordon Lanefeld, and many others. Uh, we welcome with you in this space with us, and we pray with you. Uh, this morning, I felt moved to dedicate our prayers uh, to lamenting the violence that is unfolding between Hamas and Israel right now. And the roots of this conflict are very complex, and yet what we must pray for seems pretty straightforward, for life, for love, and for peace. For our prayer this morning, I've woven together some of my own words uh, along with two other sources. First is a lament published by the Presbyterian Church's Office of Public Witness, and the second is a sermon preached by my friend and colleague, Reverend Josh Caruso of Anche Hesed Fairmount Temple at their Shabbat service this past Friday night. Please join me in prayer. Out of the depths we cry out to you, O Lord. Hear our voices. Holy One, we cry aloud for the devastation that has occurred and the fear of what might be in the days ahead. We are angry and sad, maddened and distraught, feeling hopeless. We lament the lost lives of civilians, children, sojourners, military, journalists, and aid workers. For the injured, kidnapped, abused, and refugees, we pray. We cry aloud for those whose homes have been destroyed and those who have been forced to leave their homes for safer ground. We lament the impact of war on families who become fractured or separated. We grieve in the broken recesses of our hearts, feeling so far away, but close enough that the dead, the injured, and the hostages are not foreigners at all. They are family. We remain bound to them all because we are siblings, children of the same God. We decry the violence of Hamas on Israeli citizens and the cycle of violent retaliation that it continues. Political leaders and terrorists declare war, but ordinary people pay the price. We decry that these acts of violence were committed knowing full well that Israel would retaliate and would surely kill Palestinian civilians, women and children placed helplessly in the line of fire. Human beings made in God's image being used as pawns to rid the land of Jews. We decry the promises that violence will bring victory and security. Violence does not end in victory and it will never bring us God's peace. We decry the ways that other countries around the world have contributed to this violence. We lament that our own nation's involvement in the region has not brought peace and stability, but instead causes increased militarism and division. We lament the silence of other neighboring countries who refuse to care one damn about the most vulnerable in Gaza. Where are the emergency transports to carry children, parents, and the infirm to find new homes for them? God of all nations, in the midst of our anger and our lament, we pray in deepest sighs for a peace that exceeds anything we can understand. Reaching and striving for peace separates us from becoming our own worst selves. We pray for patience with one another as we work towards peace. 
that we may listen to our neighbor and understand their pain before offering our opinions and solutions. Above all, we pray that one person at a time we may come to recognize the divine presence in one another because there will be no peace until we see the image of God in each other. God, we pray all this in the loving, peaceful name of Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. After worship, I hope that you will join us in Anderson Hall for some coffee and to take some time to participate in our note writing ministry, to write a note to a member or a friend of Fairmount who may be in need of a prayer or some love from you this day. I do hope that you had a chance to fill out your card. And if you didn't have time to hand it into the offering plate, don't worry. You can hand it to Ryan or Car whoa, you're over here. Or Car <laughs> didn't know where you were there. Or Carmen and I on the way out, uh, or get it to the church office so that we can transform these broken clocks. That I wonder if work exactly how we need them to. So friends, as you go into the world to think about the ways in which you might rest and find God's presence, I hope that you will encourage one another in that rest. Let us join together in singing the benediction. Mm -hmm. 